I totally agree with you. Heritage is a topic we are going to talk about now, so let's go. COVID-19 pandemic has boosted the digital transformation of museums. In this trend, the museum education sector has created a lot of different content, expanding their digital offers in games, interactive educational videos, or virtual reality visits. But many of these institutions now face the decision of developing a digital transformation strategy, which includes digital engagement services but also education. To help museum educators, museum content producers and all the stakeholders involved in this process as teachers and general audience in the participatory tasks, could you tell us, taking the previous principles, we talk about how immersivity can be included in the digital studies? Okay, no, that's a good question. I personally believe that as soon as we possibly can, we need to try to eliminate the difference between physically being at a museum and not physically being at a museum. So in order to do that, uh, I'm just going to define a couple of, of, uh, uh, of, of words um, to start with to, to make sense of what I'm about to say. So what I deal with is virtual reality and augmented reality, as well as, you know, physical installations, but primarily virtual and augmented reality. So let me first define what I mean as the difference between virtual and augmented reality, just for your listeners that might not be so familiar with it. So virtual reality is where you are usually wearing a headset, uh, you're usually entirely immersed in that digital world. All you see is not the room around you, but the virtual world around you, the digital world, which has been placed into this headset. So it's completely immersive to the exclusion of the physical world around you. This renders it extremely useful for observing or visiting places, either constructed or real world places at a distance. So you could, for instance, travel around the streets of Venice or uh, as we've uh, been looking at, uh, some people have a, an omnidirectional treadmill for older people so that they can visit different places in the world and get physical exercise with their friends in other parts of the world. This is very much virtual reality because they no longer see their living room or their care home or their bedroom. As far as they are concerned, they're in Venice or they're in that location. So that's virtual reality. Augmented reality is different. Augmented reality, you can see the world around you, but uh, you get an additional layer of digital information overlaid on the world around you. So you can either hold up your mobile phone or your tablet, which will bring a video, a live video onto your screen of the world around you as if you were just videoing it, but then you get these digital overlays, these three dimensional sometimes, or sometimes just information or animation, which overlays the physical world around you and gives you richer additional information, anything from translating a, a museum information card on a painting into your language, or even into audio, if you have sight impairment or reading uh, issues, to actually animating that painting, or even creating a full three-dimensional representation of that painting around you. Now, these both have their merits. The technology used for both of them is largely the same. It's been developed from the gaming industry. So there's really two, what we call 3D engines, which are primarily used for any experience, whether it be augmented or virtual reality. One is called Unreal, one is called Unity. They have their advantages and disadvantages over each other, but they're largely the same um, to anybody else apart from somebody in my industry. Now, if, for instance, you're having to, in either of these 3D engines, build a three-dimensional representation of the landscape behind the Mona Lisa so you can really see and get a context of where this was supposed to be painted and maybe the, the context of the background culturally and historically behind this woman's life, then that can be done in virtual reality using one of these 3D engines, using what we call 3D assets, like creating trees and mountains and people and, you know, uh, those same 3D assets can be used in the augmented reality experience. So the people who are, for instance, trying to visit the Louvre in Paris, who might be in Spain, they can do that in virtual reality. Whereas at the same time, the people who are in the Louvre in Paris can be viewing the same 3D assets coming to life around them in the museum as they stand in front of the real Mona Lisa. So it means that you're not having to duplicate effort 
you can use the same technology to achieve both. Now, this is where we go a step further. In terms of communication, the people who are there in the Louvre are, may not just be seeing three-dimensional uh, assets come into the, the room around them. They may also be able to see the people who are visiting from Spain so that they can communicate with each other. The people from Spain may be able to see the people in the Louvre, the actual visitors, to communicate, to walk around with them, to feel that they are physically there with each other. Now, this is where real immersive communication and technology comes in, because you could effectively have a tour guide guiding 100 people around the Louvre, of whom only 15 are actually physically there but the rest of them are coming in from Australia and the UK and Spain and, and America, and there's no barrier. They can communicate with each other, they can see each other, they can engage with these three-dimensional animated additions to the, the world, they can hear the tour guide in their own language live, and they can speak with each other and get more what we call peer peer-to-peer -peer learning and passive communication between them, which can be really vital as well. So. That means that you can use both. Now, the issue that I had from a large museum in the United Kingdom was that they were worried about using virtual reality because they were thinking, well, how do we justify still having a physical museum if most people are visiting us uh, virtually? Why don't we just have a virtual museum? And therefore, we don't need to pay all the staff and all the premises and, 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 and take cultural exhibits from one country to another in order to have them physically in a space. <clears throat> what I say is you need both. You need a physical hub. You need an anchor point in the real world where these exhibits physically are located. And you just use augmented reality to augment the experience, to add to the experience, to make it more accessible for people who are physically there. And then you use virtual reality to make it more accessible for people who are not physically there so that they can actually arrive and be there all together. It's good what to say, but I think we need to broaden discussion on this topic. It's important not only to be focused on virtual reality or augmented reality to be included in digital stages or digital plans, but also how to be immersed with the website experience or with any other tools through the internet. So I think something that could be really good is to have web-based exhibitions that include multisensory perception as soundscapes or landscapes of sounds, with sound coming from different sources. I think immersive sounds like the 3D audio, sometimes called 8D audio, is really good for creating this ambience. Another thing they can improve is their way they communicate with the audience. I think to be more personal with them helps a lot to show that you know what your audience is and the type of experience they would like. Also, what you say about virtual reality with Mona Lisa is really interesting because the Museum of Louvre has an app that shows the landscape of the house where La Gioconda live. Other museums such as Take Mother London create a Modigliani VR experience with a headset to fill what could be into the atelier of Modigliani when he lived in Montmartre. Also, the Metropolitan Museum of New York is using Instagram for disseminating their 3D models through augmented reality using filters. But apart from that, what definitely the audience needs, in my opinion, is to have ways to be immersed into the collection through meaningful website experience, including the sounds I spoke about, gamify elements, or any other experience where using the mobile phone they can interact with a big screen, giving them the opportunity to be players and decision makers of the website as a way of personalization. The tutorials from some German museums are good examples of interactive virtual exhibition where you can discover different layers, go around 3D models or play videos. To sum up, I think if the level of personalization is applied and will achieve different ways of interacting with the audience, they will be more enthusiastic and the time and the frequency they spend on the cultural website will grow. You raise a lot of really interesting points there, Raul. I actually agree with all of these, so let me see if I can break them down. Um, you mentioned uh, the, net, the, the importance of audio and soundscapes, and that, that brings us back to multi-century experiences, so I'll touch on that. Then you were talking about uh, the ability to be able to use 
augmented reality when you're actually in the experience, um, like for instance, using uh, Instagram filters, as you mentioned, which allows for interaction and gamification. And again, I would totally agree with that. And I can, I can mention some examples. And then finally, you were talking about, well, earlier, in fact, you were talking about the uh, being able to actually incorporate these into more conventional web-based experiences or online experiences that perhaps don't require a virtual reality headset. And I totally agree on that one as well. This actually brings us back to web-based, in this case, virtual reality. So let me start off briefly with what you were talking about with audio. Audio is vitally important. And with what we call binaural audio, uh, which really just uh, mimics the uh, where sound is coming from in space, because our brains are very finely attuned to knowing where sound comes from. It's part of our hunter-gatherer heritage. We need to know where our prey animals are, how far away they are, how fast they're moving, and what angle they are in relation to us. The same with predators, right? So the only way that we can actually interpret this is the tiny delays of when the sound hits our left ear, and then it hits our right ear. That's literally the, the, all that we're picking up on. Uh, and then our brain does the rest of the interpretation depending on the delay, depending on the volume and so forth. Now, that the beauty of the simplicity of that in terms of how our physical ears work is that that can be completely recreated using a standard set of earphones and using a recording apparatus, which is basically the size and shape of a human head whether that be vir virtually or physically, uh, that they're recording from where your ears would be. And therefore you can record these simple stereo tracks and play them back through conventional, completely ordinary headphones and still get that sense of, of distance and direction, which is great for people who are uh, tapping in remotely through, for instance, remote uh, web-based experience or virtual reality. It's not as easy to recreate, ironically, in the actual environment when you're physically there because museums themselves can be noisy places. You've got all these people around you. You don't have the same control as a curator of a museum over the audio and where it's coming from. So one of the things that I'm speaking to a guy called uh, uh, Lee Edwards about is creating something which we're referring to at the moment as a holodeck. So just like the holodeck in Star Trek, the next generation where you walk into a room and it recreates any environment you wish. Now, this can be done. Lee has already been able to do this on a massive scale, like 30 meter square scale um, with LED screens and panels. Or you can use something called projection mapping, which projects onto the wall. But either way, it recreates the any experience you want from the, the uh, medieval battles of Culloden in Scotland to, um, to you know, modern uh, experiences and modern artistic immersive experiences. Now, these LED panels are what's called audio transparent. That means that you can pass sound through them at any point. So, for instance, if you were in a B-52 bomber and uh, in your experience and you wanted to, you know, somebody's firing a gun from just off to your right, you'll hear the sound come from exactly where you're seeing the physical image coming from, which is massively important. Very easy to do in virtual reality, as I say, but very difficult to do in the physical environment in the space. But that's what we're working on. Now, this lends itself to another very important sense, which we haven't spoken about yet, which is smell. Because your olfactory sense, your smell sense, passes through the olfactory bulb in the front of your brain, which actually passes directly through where your memory cortex is, where you store memories, which is why smells can be so powerfully evocative of specific memories, like where, what, where you were when you first smelled that smell. Now, let's go back to our B-52 bomber example. Not only are you seeing the gunner firing a gun, not only are you hearing the gun coming from your right, but you're smelling the cordite coming from the gun. You're smelling the diesel fuel in the engine. You know, you're, it's the full experience. And that will not only makes it more real, but because of the effect of smell on your memory, it makes it more memorable. It means that you go away with that with that memory more firmly implanted in your mind than it would otherwise be, which is, let's face it, the, uh, the, the point of the, uh, the point of the process is to create a memorable experience. So that's 
that's sound. <laughs> so we've covered sound. So now you mentioned um, being able to use um, uh, augmented reality filters using Instagram or let's say Snapchat, Facebook filters. There's basically all the social media channels apart from LinkedIn, as far as I know, have their own augmented reality filters. Now, What's good about this is that the app that, you know, you'll have an Instagram app or a Facebook app on your phone, you won't generally be using it straight from the browser if it's on a phone. So that means that they can actually download everything that you need to have these virtual, real uh, these augmented reality experiences. Because normally with augmented reality, or up until recently, you had to download an app for every experience that you were having. Now that's a, what we call a friction point. That's a, a stage of hassle, a stage of, of, of a barrier between the user um, and the experience because they can't just bring up their phone and immediately the thing's happening. They have to go through this process of downloading. But with a filter on a social media channel or a social media app, it's already there. Now that's great because it means that you can get to that experience of the of the artwork coming to life in front of you or the gamification that you were talking about, the interactivity, without any barriers, without any additional downloads requiring on your phone. Now that has actually got even easier now because we're now we're moving into the realms of web-based augmented reality, browser-based augmented reality. You'll, you'll hear the term more and more in future, web AR, we've, we've abbreviated it to. And it just means that instead of downloading an app to have an augmented reality experience, you just click on a QR code or type in a short link, you know, a short web address, and effectively it opens up a web page on your phone and immediately the augmented reality experience is happening. It's occurring straight away. And that means that we can use those. In fact, we are using those in a museum in London so that we can, uh, for instance, when the person walks into the museum, they point their phone at a QR code and immediately it will bring up a, a, a navigation route for them to go through the museum. And depending on what they're most interested in, it can either be talking about the the uh, colonial past of Britain, in which case it will take you to the same exhibits, but in a different order, depending on what era these exhibits were culturally appropriated or stolen from these countries. Or you could have more of an interest in the, the growth of Celtic culture, in which case it will take you to the Egyptian exhibits and the Welsh exhibits and the Portuguese and the Scottish exhibits. It's the same exhibits, but in a different order with a different message. Or it might uh, you might just want to know about Egyptology, in which case it will just take you straight to the Egyptian culture one and give you a more detailed. But what, what I'm getting at here is that it can then take into account animation, gamification, navigation, translation into your language. Again, that could be audio, auditory or it can be visual and text. And it can bring up the sounds that you were talking about with your phones. So that for instance, you can hear what it sounds like to be in a Pharaoh's tomb. You can say, you know, you can hear what it sounds, what a Celtic battle sounded like and, and you can see these things come to life around you. And finally, just to get to the last point, the virtual reality. Now, again, you mentioned that uh, you don't necessarily want to have to have a virtual reality headset. I agree totally. I have got a strong background in education and a major part of what we're trying to do with virtual reality education is to make it work on any device, whether that be a very cheap phone or a tablet or a basic laptop or a, you know whether that be a PC or a Mac. And if you have a virtual reality headset, great, you can use that. So what we've been doing is we've been finding online virtual reality platforms, like a good example is Mozilla Hubs, that requires no download. It's where web-based augmented reality that we were talking about, this is web-based virtual reality, web VR. And it will work on any device because all the hard work is being done elsewhere, it's being done in the cloud. So all you're doing is effectively going to a web page, which you can navigate in three dimensions, uh, just as you would in virtual reality. And uh, it allows anybody to access it and it reduces this uh, digital divide, we call it digital inequality between those who can afford very expensive equipment and those who cannot. Now, admittedly, you do have to have an internet connection. You do have to have access to the data levels required to send that information to your phone. But as, as uh, for instance, Starlink and OneWeb are putting up low Earth orbit satellites, the point of this is to give everybody in the world cheap access to high 
uh, bandwidth internet, which means that the, what I'm describing here is going to be entirely possible anywhere in the world, whether or not you have a broadband connection or a, a Wi-Fi connection. You could be in the middle of a desert, you could be in the middle of the sea, and you'll still be able to get this high bandwidth uh, internet access, which means that this web virtual reality will be possible and accessible for free for everyone. I think there's one thing you mentioned we need to highlight, democratization of the culture. For example, to enjoy this kind of virtual experience, you don't need an expensive Oculus headset, you only need a technological device, and a mobile phone, or you can create your own cardboard, as Google have worked on it to make it possible, open licenses creating useful materials for creating your own apps with Unity, Buforia, and many other options. That's a really good fact and the cultural heritage institutions can take advantage of this for opening their collection and creating new experience in AR or VR with their own 3D models to engage with their audience. And also to dim disseminate their 3D models and metadata through APIs within through an open access philosophy. I would agree. And I think that uh, a, a good friend of mine, Robbie Stamp, was talking to me about this a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that not only should we have a democratization of access to these experiences, but also in terms of heritage, in terms of museums, we could, with this technology, particularly the on-site augmented reality, we could have democratization of curation, where it's not just the curators of the museum who decide what exhibits you should go or what you know to from one order to the next as I was describing earlier on visitors could set up their own routes and say I went to this museum and I went from this you know they they can form their own connections between exhibits or even connections between completely separate museums in the same location for instance you can already travel between the Tate Museum and the Tate Modern Museum quite easily there's like a, a boat which will take you up the Thames in London so why not and then in, in somewhere like Amsterdam, there's so many museums within easy walking distance of each other. Why not curate, create or allow your visitors to, to create their own um, tours effectively in specific orders? And then those can be rated by other visitors. They can be experienced by other visitors. And it can be all based on the background of that individual, for instance. Let's say that individual comes from sub-Saharan Africa. They can just they can take people around all of the museums that have actually taken exhibits or taken historical artifacts from their country from their continent and put them into these alien environments alien contexts and actually say right this is where this comes from this is my culture this is my explanation of this which is so much more valuable than what a bunch of disconnected western academics think is important about African culture. Do you see what I'm, I mean? So you can democratize all aspects of this, not just the access, but the actual cur curation as well. I totally agree with that perspective of cooperation for development. I think the democratization of the culture allows anyone to be their own curator and have their own virtual exhibition at home. And it's a really good option for education because teacher can be the facilitator or trainers for creating new projects in the classroom with their students using these immersive environments. Also, the distinction between physical and virtual needs to be more diffuse, mixing both concepts in the same way, and also to understand better that a virtual reality is a new experience different from the physical exhibition. Once you have different emotions happening, and even the aiming audience can be totally new, because it's a way of broadening and diversifying it. And actually, as a final point, uh, you're mentioning the importance of obviously the difference of being physically there with the emerging technology of wearable augmented reality interfaces. Uh, they're basically getting to the stage where they're as light as a normal pair of glasses and they just have a connection, a, a, a tethered connection, a cable, which plugs into your phone. And so without having to be holding up your phone and looking through it at your exhibits, you can just be walking around quite naturally seeing the augmentation to the exhibits and your phone is doing the processing. That's what makes the glasses so light and so cheap. So it's actually going to be a very, very low uh, investment cost for the museums to be able to provide these glasses and then people just plug them into their own phones and uh, tap them on a QR code or a near, near field beacon or something like that which activates the experience of the whole museum 
and they wear these glasses, they get to walk around it perfectly naturally, but get these augmentations should they wish them. And that means that, uh, that it doesn't interfere, you know, because like I said earlier on, you want the you want the experience to be as natural and instinctive as possible. So if you're having to put your phone in front of your face the whole time, that that, that that's a barrier. Whereas if you can just be looking at the thing as you normally would and then call up information in a bit more detail as and when you want it, that there is a, a much more natural way of doing things. That's a good point. I think it won't be for a long time when we have access to smart glasses as the Google wants in physical situation to spawn our knowledge in real time because something really comfortable to wear instead of taking your mobile phone along the session. No, 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 no. This stuff is being released right now. There's about um, six or seven glasses in the market right now. Um, they range in price from £200 per uh, set to £400 per set. And this is the first generation. So if the prices are so low now, they're going to go down and down and down. But these already exist. Well, we have talked about the relevance of immersivity in digital education projects, the key elements for getting immersive experience, and its conclusion in the museum digital stages and programs. To end this talk, I would like to talk with you about how immersivity can be applied in a practical way. So could you tell the listeners which are your recommendations to produce the most immersive and engaging digital heritage education experience for young people? For young people specifically? Okay, <laughs> well, it's easier for young people no, that's that's fine because it's easier for young people because young people are more adaptable to new ways of doing things. Uh, even as I am like forty-five nearly, and I find that it's uh, the older I get, the harder it is for me to adapt to new ways of doing things. Um, I would say that, or you know, as time goes on, because technology is changing continuously, that is actually getting easier for people as they're older, but simply because they have to adapt all the time. But younger people. It's never a problem. So the technology and the instinctive nature of it becomes less of a barrier for younger people because they will pick things up and get the hang of them quite quickly, down to the fact of uh, neuroplasticity, down to the fact that their brains are very malleable and very open to, to learning new skills and so forth um, the, you know, at that age. So it then comes down to comprehension. It then comes down to <clears throat> communicating something in a way which isn't exclusionary and is easy for them to understand, but also memorable and captivating and interesting for them to understand. And that usually comes down to interactivity. Kids want to pick things up. They want to engage with things. They want to get a sense of ownership. There was a post that I shared recently on LinkedIn and it was a it was a physical exhibit. It was a children's museum, I think in Pittsburgh, who um, there was an artist, I can't remember his name, but I'll try and share the link for your podcast, um, had created mechanical interaction tools for traditional pieces of art. Everything from the, the, the Laughing Cavalier to um, some Dada start. And um, you could actually interact with that. So the, the famous painting of the, uh, the gentleman in the Borla hat with an apple in front of his face, you can pump a pump and the, uh, the apple will grow and grow and grow until it pops or it will drop off. Or you can turn a handle which moves a finger in to poke the Laughing Cavalier and he gets po poked backwards and forwards and his hat falls off and so forth. That level of interaction, the, the results on LinkedIn were mixed. Some people were saying, this is sacrilege, this is shouldn't be you know making light of these classical pieces of art but I would argue and as did many people you're making it fun you're making it interactive you're making it memorable you're creating a positive experience a, a, a pleasant experience for these kids at their formative stage in their life so that they associate art and these artworks in particular with pleasure. They're not going to forget these pieces of art and they're going to be drawn to those art, that are in culture more in the future because they associate it with pleasure and fun. So that's one way of looking at it, even though those interactions were not contextually relevant, they were just interaction for the sake of it, for the fun of it. But if you can then take kids into it, where, and you mentioned this earlier yourself, Raul, um, where you can actually interact with the art in order to strip away the layers, learn more about what's going on there. For instance, instead of just seeing the painting, to be able to then see the studio that the painting was being carried out in, to be able to see the artist 
doing the painting to be able to look into the face of Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci and, uh, and actually see them at work and then learn more about them and walk outside of their studio into Florence in, you know, the, uh, the, the, the period of time that, uh, sorry, I can't remember what period of time Leonardo was, uh, was active, but, uh, you know, to be able to actually see the culture and see the people and really get a sense of the space. Or if you're physically there, there was a, funnily enough, it was somebody who had nothing to do with the cultural background. He was a, a, a corporate furnishing specialist, but he had traveled to ancient, well, he traveled to Greece and he noticed that they were recreating or effectively reinstating parts of the amphitheater in Athens to make it look as it did at the time when it was being actively used. And uh, he didn't really like that because he didn't get the sense of what it looks like now as a ruin and you didn't get the sense of you know what it looked like at the time he said wouldn't it be better to be able to actually travel in time uh, using augmented reality so that you are yes you're walking through these whitewashed ruins of of, of of ancient buildings but through augmented reality you can you can travel back to when these were built and when they were new and the, see the people around you you know who helped to build it and how they interacted at that time and really get that sense of of the scale of time um and the the experience which can be done both virtual and, and augmented reality as well. And that's something that, again, we're going to be doing in London is that we're going to be looking at uh, old war vehicles and they're ruined now. They've been dredged up from the bottom of the, the North Sea and they're rusted, you know, and full of bullet holes. But to be able to look at those through uh, kind of the same kind of binoculars, the coin operated binoculars that you see in tall buildings and at the seaside. And while looking through that, you can then see now that plane is whole, it's new again, it's flying now, it's in, engaged in an aerial battle, you can look inside and see the flight crew acting. This kind of stuff means that you get a full understanding, it's no longer just an object, it's a piece of history and you're engaged with it, you're immer immersed in it. So basically that's the, those are the two aspects of it. Contextually relevant interaction, so that you can really get the sense of the origin and the meaning of the piece, and um, pure interaction for the sake of it in order to develop the fun multi-sensory uh, uh, interactivity and ownership of the piece. Thank you for those recommendations. They will help our audience to develop more creative and immersive experience. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about immersive experiences and spaces for heritage education projects and resources. My pleasure, Ro. Thank you very much for having me. If you would like to learn more about immersive experience in museums, I recommend you to read the handbook published by the Lab Making Sense of Immersion 2020. To learn how to produce immersive experience using digital storytelling, I suggest you to read the book published by Film House, Art House, via Film and Transmedia and Create Converts, titled Storytelling Beyond the Screen, Creating Narrative for Immersive and Interactive Spaces. Writing by eight outstanding professionals in the field of video production, sound design, transmedia storytelling, AR, and VR in 2019. If you want to know European projects working on cultural heritage immersive experience for education, I recommend you to visit the Cultured Up project website. Project Experience in the Augmented Reality and Cultural Heritage Application in IVET, Cultup, seeks to inspire young people for vocational schools for Europe's culture through the implementation of augmented reality technologies in IVET, initial vocational education and training, curricula for a better cultural experience. Another interesting project is the BIM project. BIM is a coordination and support action funded under the European Union Horizon 2020 program from 16-2019 in order to define and support high-quality policies, take and day-to-day -day decision making, the utilization of big throw, technological development and to nurture an evidence-based view on growth and development impact by digital cultural heritage and virtual museums in particular. All the results of BIM are visible on this platform. Thank you very much for being here today with David W. Simon and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Find all the resources from the topic we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the It's Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. 
See you next week.